Hi, Ukrainians are desperate to acquire some Western jets to boost their capabilities. Officially, there's no decision, but it's quite clear that they will receive these aircraft at some point in a future not too far. Or at least this is what I believe and many other analysts do believe as well. And actually, the Ukrainians are refurbishing some of their air bases to host them. In many cases, the announcement of armament transfer to Ukraine has only confirmed the activities that were already ongoing. So it's reasonable to suspect that pilots and ground personnel are already in training, even because in this case, training may require about one year, even when rushing it. The most likely candidate is the American F-16 because it's widely available. The United States Air Force has several units mothballed that could be restored, but there are also other countries that are phasing out the F-16s because they are acquiring the F-35 that actually could donate it. And in the press, several other hypotheses have emerged, like the Mirage 2000, of which the French have several units in storage, but also more modern aircraft like the Rafale or the Eurofighter. The aircraft that the majority of the analysts believe that would be ideal for Ukraine is the Swedish Gripen. It is designed from the ground up to operate from austere bases with minimal maintenance and little trained personnel, which is exactly their situation. And it also carries the Meteor missile, which is probably the only Western weapon so far that can be kinematically at least a match for the Russian R-37M. Well, so far is the chronicle of the events and I'm sure many of you are already aware of all this. But I and many others have noticed that this subject is much more heavily debated, at least in public, than any other weapon system delivery. And indeed, Ukrainians are desperate to have them. Well, but the reason is not really about the aircraft. So Western weapons provided to Ukraine have already had an important impact on the war. However, air power has the potential to be a game changer, and this time for real. Obviously, air power has always been extremely important, but its nature has changed quite radically in the last two or three decades. So to better understand the improvement, let's make a comparison between a mission that happened in the early 80s and a mission that happened in 2016. In the night between the 1st and the 2nd of May 1982, the Argentinian carrier Ara 25 de Mayo was in the South Atlantic, north of the Falkland Islands, steaming southeast. It was on its way to launch a surprise attack on a British carrier group centered around the Invincible Carrier, in an attempt to replicate the Battle of Midway in the South Atlantic. The attack had to be executed by the A4Qs of the Terciera Esquadrilla Aeronaval de Casa Yataque, and the commander of the squadron, Capitan de Corbieta Rodolfo Castrofox, remembers. Six A4Qs were prepared for action, each armed with four Mark 82 bombs. I was to lead the attack, and a further aircraft would be readied in reserve, and another to act as a tanker for the return. By using the table of probabilities, considering the capability of the British anti-aircraft defenses, of our six initial aircraft, four would be getting to a position to drop their bombs, and only two would make it back. Of the 16 bombs that we would release, there would be a probability of impact of 25%. In other words, four bombs of 500 pounds. This could neutralize an aircraft carrier and the loss of four aircraft would be acceptable. While the idea that these losses were given for granted is sending shivers down my spine every time I read that passage. However, the key point was the 25% probability of impact. 
with non-guided bombs, three out of four were going to be wasted, and yet landing 25% of the weapons on a target as large as an aircraft carrier would have been a success. Fast forward to 2016. The RAF No. 1 Squadron is deployed at Akrotiri Air Base in Cyprus with six aircraft. The mission is to support the Kurds, the Iraqi and other coalition forces in the war against ISIS in northern Iraq and eastern Syria. Mike Sutton, the squadron commander at the time, describes a very interesting mission in his book. Boss, a tasking came from the Air Operations Center while you were airborne, so the expeditionary air wing approached Johnny to discuss it. It's sensitive. They want an IED factory destroyed ASAP, Johnny explained. The thing is, Johnny continued, it's huge. Several large buildings, they want it completely destroyed in a single attack to make sure none of the bomb maker's stuff can be salvaged in the event of partial damage. And there's more. They think it will need 16 weapons to destroy the target. Hitting 16 different targets from a single formation in a single pass had not been conducted for some considerable time by the RAF, and never by the Typhoon Force. Fast forward to the mission. With a thud, the left outboard weapon released with a small explosive partridge firing it away from the wing. A few milliseconds later, another thud, this time from the right wing. Then another, then another. 20 seconds. 16 weapons were flying towards their separate targets. I zoom pod out to observe the whole factory. There was no question about the importance of the attack. I felt the stress rush it up. 10 seconds. 5. I held my breath as the weapons slammed into the target. With an endless succession of flashes and blasts, the ground below erupted into flying debris. Where an IED factory had been, nothing remained. Remained. complex had been completely and utterly obliterated. 16 weapons, 16 hits, and the target obliterated. Well, the implications are obvious and it's probably not even worth discussing. However, there is one aspect that is worth mentioning. In the same book, Mike Sutton describes how many of his missions consisted in very long patrols with four paveways strapped under the typhoon wings ready to hit a target when the ground controller was going to call them in. He was waiting for the nine liners that is a standard format that the ground controller, the JTAC, is using to communicate with the aircraft and clearly state the mission that they want to be executed, the initial point, the flight limitations, the targets, the way the target is marked, where are the friendly forces, and so on. And the pilot, or better, a flight of two aircraft, could receive as many messages and hit as many targets as the number of weapons available. Each paveway was more powerful and more precise than anything the ground forces could deploy. It is much heavier and contains much more explosive than an artillery shell, an anti-tank missile, or even an MLRS. And with a single hit, it can destroy a house, a bunker, a tank, a howitzer, or really almost anything. And the Typhoon carried four weapons. Do you see the point here? A single aircraft with precision-guided weapons in absence of relevant threats can cause a disproportional amount of damage to the ground forces, their logistics, and their support. Much more than a single tank, a single MLRS, or a single cannon can do. And this is what Ukrainians really want. They want air power. Sure, they need to acquire at least local air superiority first, so they need aircraft that can match the Russian fighters, and also all the equipment necessary to conduct effective sea missions. And crucially, they need the training and the logistics to sustain these missions. After that, and even more than that, they need precision-guided weapons capable of hitting stationary and moving targets to quickly degrade the Russian forces where and when they are going to strike. So if they end up getting the F-16s, they also need the targeting pods, JDAMs and payways in quantities sufficient to effectively hit the Russians. This is what they want and this is what they need. Will they get it? Well, 
I and many others with me think yes, but we'll see. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.